All right. I hope everyone can hear me. Okay, I think we can start. So people who were there in the previous classes, uh, they should remember that we started off uh, with, with section one, business and its environment. Business and its environment, that's section one. the main title, the first section, and the topics that we covered last week, there was business activity. This is just, just a recap for those who have just joined. So the classes that we conducted last week in section one, these are the topics you should know if you want to revise these business activity. Then there were the sectors of production primary, secondary, tertiary, comparatively simpler topics. Then there was adding value, how to change the perception of the customers. We tried to understand the concept with the help of a few examples. Then there was ethics, CSR, triple bottom line. We had a detailed discussion regarding this, the ethical issues, corporate social responsibility, and triple bottom line. 
this was followed by by size and growth of businesses and in this topic size and growth of businesses so far we've covered internal and external growth remember we try to draw a line between internal and external growth internal growth is the one in which you grow a business grows while depending on its own resources an external growth in which two or more businesses they combine into one and then we discussed that in external growth there could be a friendly merger there could be a hostile takeover there could be a joint venture and then we also try to differentiate between vertical integration horizontal integration and conglomerates so the new topic the fresh topic under discussion today that's economies and diseconomies of scale i just mentioned this last time now we're going to discuss this in detail and we'll try to see we'll try to learn about uh, the various types of economies internal and external etc so as i was saying the topic is economies and diseconomies of scale ye hoga iske baad the next topic will be management by objectives the mbo theory by peter drucker so economies may we define the term i'll just go through it once more the term economies of scale it is defined as the reduction in average costs right reduction in average costs because of the expansion a growth of a business that's what the concept is all about economies of scale it is the reduction in average costs you can use the term average costs or you you can use the term per unit cost so the reduction in average cost because of expansion or growth that's what economies of scale is all about the concept the reduction in average cost per unit cost for instance when you purchase something in bulk you get discounts that's basically what the concept is as far as economies of scale is concerned so the topic is economies and diseconomies of scale first of all we will define the term economies of scale is the reduction in average costs because of the growth or expansion of a business then we should know the economies of scale are broadly classified into internal economies and external economies of scale theek hai economies of scale they're further classified into internal and external economies of scale so what's the basic difference between internal and external economies the term internal economies is is used when a single firm grows in size theek hai you need to understand what the difference is between internal economies and external economies the term internal economies is used when a single firm grows in size all right when a single firm grows in size irrespective of what is happening to the industry as a whole dekho you should all know what the difference is between a firm and an industry first internal economies of scale they come into effect when a single firm grows in size what is the difference between a firm and an industry a firm remember is a single independent business organization you can say a textile mill a car manufacturer a single firm honda could be a firm a single firm. an industry the word industry describes a collection of firms making similar products an industry is a collection of firms making similar products industry describes the collective situation firm an independent organization that's what the basic difference is like if honda is a firm then honda and mitsubishi and toyota and suzuki is a car manufacturing industry so all the firms making similar products that's an industry 
and a single organization is a firm. So internal economies of scale will come into effect if a single firm grows in size. We're not talking about the industry here. When a single firm grows in size, and the advantages that it enjoys, those are internal economies of scale. And when the entire industry grows in size, in totality, the entire industry grows in size, those are external economies of scale. Take internal economies when a single firm grows in size, irrespective of what is happening to the industry, and external economies when the entire industry grows in size as a whole. So let's first. Let's go through the types of internal economies of, of scale. There are numerous internal economies of scale, and then there are different external economies. Let's try and go through the internal economies of scale first. When a single firm grows in size. All right. So internal economies of scale, these are the types. The first one which is the most common, that's purchasing economies of scale. The first internal economy of scale is the purchasing economies of scale. So purchasing economies of scale, as many of us might have an idea, simply are the advantages of bulk buying. What are purchasing economies of scale? The advantages of bulk buying. Bulk buying, when you purchase something in bulk, when you purchase something in a large quantity, you get discounts from your suppliers. If you purchase one kilogram, they might charge 100 rupees. If you purchase 1,000 kilograms, they might charge 90 rupees a kg. So these advantages of bulk buying, the discounts that you get from your suppliers, when you purchase material in bulk, those are called purchasing economies of scale the advantages of bulk buying, purchasing economies of scale. All right. Number two would be risk bearing economies. Then we have risk bearing economies of scale. Risk bearing economies, remember, I think we've used this term before. Risk bearing economies. I suppose we have used the term before. Risk bearing economies of scale are the ones that are enjoyed by a large firm when it widens the range of its products. Remember last time we discussed conglomerates? And I mentioned at that time that conglomerates, they enjoy risk-bearing economies of scale. The same concept will come into effect here. Risk-bearing economies of scale are the advantages enjoyed by a large firm when it widens the range of its products. As you know, large firms, they have a wide range of products. And what is the plus point? The risk factor is distributed. The risk factor is reduced. The risk factor is minimized. So large firms, they have a wide range of products, or you can say they can afford to have a wide range of products. They can afford to have a wide range of products large firms, because of which the risk factor is distributed. Take it, the risk factor is, it is minimized. For example, a company making electronics, you know, it will have refrigerators, it will have music systems, it will have television sets. So the risk factor is reduced. Like we were discussing last time in conglomerates, Gillette has taken over, remember Parker pens and Duracell batteries and all. So if one product doesn't work, it can rely on the other product. 
That is why all large firms, they have a wide range of products. For example, Nestle has a range of products, including almost 1,500 different products. You know, if, if, if KitKat is not profitable, they can rely on the water. If water is not profitable, they can rely on Cyrillac. This is, this is what risk-bearing economies is all about. So we were discussing internal economies of scale. The first one is purchasing economies, advantages of bulk buying. Number two, risk-bearing. Large firms, they have a wide range of products. And the risk factor is reduced. Number three, financial economies of scale. All these, they come under internal economies, financial economies of scale. Now, financial economies of scale, internal economy of scale number three. In financial economies of scale, they basically, they indicate that large firms, it is easier for large firms to borrow money from a financial institution. It is easier for large firms to borrow from a financial institution. We have discussed current financial economies of scale. It is easier for large firms, you can say, to get their loan application approved. Easier for large firms to get their loan application approved. You should use the term credit-worthy borrowers. Large firms are credit-worthy borrowers. Try to remember this term, credit-worthiness. That large firms, large firms are credit-worthy borrowers. Large firms are credit-worthy borrowers. Okay, this basically means it is easier for a large firm to convince the bank authorities to approve their loan application. You know, if a small firm goes to a bank, the bank might be reluctant because the bank is looking for something that we call credit worthiness. You know, does this organization, does this person deserve a loan, loan or not? Does this person qualify for a loan or not? The large firms, because of their financial status and because of their size, they qualify for a loan easily. That's called financial economies of scale because they enjoy financial security. Okay. So they are risk bearing economies of scale, they are financial economies of scale, they are purchasing economies of scale. And then you might also add technical and managerial. You can combine these two, technical and managerial economies of scale. The large firms, they also enjoy technical and managerial economies of scale. Large firms enjoy technical and managerial economies of scale also. which basically means that large firms can afford to specialize. They can, they can afford to specialize in terms of workforce, managers, as well as machinery. You know, technical and managerial economies of scale, this means the large firm can specialize in terms of workforce, in terms of managers, in terms of machinery, equipment. So you can a simple point take they have the resources, they are large, they have the resources to hire specialists. So a small firm can't afford to hire a specialist. They have resources to purchase technologically advanced equipment, high tech machinery. Small firms can't do that. So these technical and managerial economies of scale this must also be added to the list of internal economies of scale. Okay, they've got better workers, better managers, better machinery. So the quality standards obviously are better. Now let's switch to external economies of scale. So far, whatever we've discussed, these were internal economies. Now we need to know a bit about external economies of scale. And as I was mentioning in the beginning, Internal economies are discussed when a single firm grows in size. External economies, 
when the entire industry grows in size when the entire industry grows in size external economies so external economy scale number 1 is called ancillary services ancillary services a n c i d l l a r y ancillary services this is external economy of scale number 1 ancillary services remember this these ancillary services ancillary services are supporting services all right ancillary services what are these these are supporting services ancillary services are supporting services and why do we call these supporting services because these services are provided by one industry to another theek okay? hai when one when a service is provided by one industry to another usually in the shape of raw material that's called an ancillary service ancillary services ancillary services for instance in ancillary services you can say the dairy farmers the dairy farmers provide the ice cream industry with an ancillary service in the shape of the supply of raw material which is milk in this case so the dairy farmers are providing ancillary services to the ice cream industry all right or maybe the supplier of wood is providing an ancillary service to the furniture manufacturers all right so when one industry grows the other industry also grows you know for instance if the footwear industry is growing the industry that provides them with leather they also grow so both the industries benefit now the footwear industry they don't have to to worry about the availability of the availability of high quality leather in a large quantity they don't have to worry about this why because the leather industry is also growing obviously when there is demand for leather because the footwear industry is growing the leather industry will also grow so this is what the concept of ancillary services is all about these external economies of scale that when one industry grows the other other industry also expands which is mutually beneficial beneficial for both so ancillary services are provided easily you can find raw material easily then the second external economy of scale is availability of labor then we have availability of labor external economy of scale number 2 this basically means that whenever an industry grows it is usually concentrated in one particular area i think we have observed this in pakistan also that whenever an industry grows whenever it expands it is usually concentrated in one particular area it usually focuses on one particular area you know that area that city becomes known for that industry the city becomes known for that industry all right for instance pakistan a very common example sialkot is known for sports goods industry because most of the manufacturers of sports goods they are operating in sialkot the industry is concentrated in that particular area like faisalabad is known for textile so when one industry grows and it is concentrated in one particular area 
a huge workforce comes into existence. A large workforce comes into existence. A large skilled workforce comes into existence. For example, in Sialkot, it is comparatively easier to find a worker who knows how to make a football or a cricket bat or a squash racket. Because over the years, generation after generation, they've learned those skills. Okay? So workers with these skills, they're useful for the entire industry. The entire industry benefits in this situation. All right, so availability of skilled workers, availability of skilled labor, that is also an external economy of skill. Then another one could be commercial facilities. The first one, these are external economies of scale, pellet and salary services, then availability of skilled labor. Number three, commercial facilities. Look, commercial facilities, these are also supporting services, like in salary. These are also supporting services pr provided by one industry to another. And salary, these are also supporting services. But the difference is between commercial and, and, and salary services, commercial facilities and salary services, the difference is that commercial facilities are provided by the tertiary sector. You know, by the tertiary sector, like advertising, transportation, security, banking, insurance. So when one industry grows, the tertiary sector starts providing them with these commercial facilities. If the textile mills are growing, maybe the banking industry, they come up with a special package for them, better interest rates or something. The insurance companies, they offer facilities to them. If the furniture industry is growing, the transporters might facilitate them to, to carry their furniture to different areas. So security, storage, transportation, insurance, banking, commercial facility. This is another external economy. So keep in mind, the whole industry is benefiting from this. Then number four would be cooperation. They could always keep in mind the firms in one industry, under normal circumstances, they're rivals, they're competitors. The firms in one industry, they're rivals, obviously, they're competitors under normal circumstances. Two textile mills are rivals, two schools are rivals, two petrol stations, they're competitors. Right? They represent the same industry, but they're competitors. However, sometimes, if the situation demands, if the situation demands, these, these competitors, they start cooperating with each other. If the situation demands, these competitors, these rivals, they might start cooperating with each other so that they can raise their voice together, collectively. And they will have a greater impact. That's called cooperation. That is external economy of scale number four. You know, this is, this is I'll just try, try and quote an example here, just to make sure that you understand what the term cooperation indicates over here. You see, if there's a single, there's, there's a particular individual shopkeeper you know, if he's unhappy with the government policies and he announces that I'm on a strike, nobody would care. But when the whole market goes on a strike, the government will have to respond. So you know, this is a similar situation. Okay, when one steel mill is on a strike, nobody would care. But when the entire steel industry is on a strike against government policies, high taxes, etc., the government will have to do something. So this is cooperation, when an industry is large and strong and established, they can stand united 
and they can exert pressure on the government more forcefully they can fight for their rights or they can pull in or they can do other stuff they can launch a collective advertising campaign they can establish r and d centers they can publish magazines together this is called cooperation so the firms in one industry under normal circumstances are rivals but sometimes for a common cause they might cooperate with each with each other and in this way they'll be more convincing whatever they say they'll be heard right that's cooperation and the last external economy of scale that is called disintegration the last one is called disintegration you need to understand this remember last week when we we we, we had a class i think in the last class we try to understand the term integration vertical horizontal conglomerates remember so integration is to combine to integrate is to combine disintegration means to be apart to disintegrate to be separated so external economy of scale number 5 is called disintegration and this basically means disintegration means that when a production process becomes too time consuming yeah when a production process becomes too complicated so it is often disintegrated into numerous simpler processes it is often disintegrated or divided into numerous simpler processes theek hai whenever a production process becomes too time consuming it is often disintegrated into numerous simpler processes and now each new process will be managed by a different industry it will be managed by a different group of firms i'll quote a simple example here for instance production of cotton cloth is a complicated time consuming process so production of cotton cloth like we have seen in pakistan it has been disintegrated into ginning weaving spinning finishing dyeing so one process has been disintegrated into numerous simpler processes now ginning firms are separate textile mills are separate dyeing plants are separate these are different industries now the ginning firms they only specialize in ginning dyeing plants they only specialize in dyeing this is called disintegration like a division of work takes place specialization takes place time management improves that's disintegration so these five are the external economies of scale and salary services availability of skilled labor cooperation commercial facilities and disintegration now quickly in the end i would like to highlight two diseconomies of scale so far we discussed internal economies and external economies but there are a couple of diseconomies also you can say economies of scale are the advantages of growth diseconomies are the drawbacks of growth generally there are two diseconomies of scale if you want to define it how do you define diseconomies economies of scale kya thi reduction in average cost this economies the increase in average costs how do you define the term diseconomies of scale it is the increase in average costs when a business grows beyond the optimum size how do you define diseconomies of scale the increase in average costs when a business grows beyond the optimum size Okay, when a business becomes too large, when a firm becomes too large, the average costs instead of going down, they might start to increase. This is called diseconomies of scale, and there are two types. Number one, management problems. This is the one which is more common: management problems. Obviously, when a firm becomes too large, 
management problem management problems will arise because it is easier to manage one factory as compared to managing two factories or 10 factories easier to focus on one branch rather than managing 10 branches management problems will arise issues relating to control coordination communication such issues will arise so this economy of scale number 1 kya hua management problems administrative issues the large firms are more difficult to manage human resource management is difficult quality control financial management so whenever a firm grows beyond the optimum size management problems will arise that's number 1 and the last point this economy of scale number 2 that is called rising prices of inputs this economy of scale number 2 rising prices of inputs first this economy is management problems number 2 rising prices of inputs you need to understand this this is the last point dekho the word input represents workers raw material theek hai na machinery workers raw material machinery that's the input theek hai na which will lead to an output so we are discussing rising prices of inputs the point to be understood over here is that you know usually when you purchase raw material in bulk you get discounts we discussed this today also purchasing economies of scale however if the supplier has a monopoly and the large firms or a large firm has to purchase raw material in bulk the supplier might take advantage of the situation and instead of offering discounts he might start overcharging the buyer ye baat samajh mein aa rahi hai under normal circumstances when you purchase in bulk you will get discounts but when the supplier has a monopoly he will have the upper hand he will exploit the situation okay acha pehle you were purchasing 10000 kilograms now your firm is grow has grown and you want to purchase 20000 kilograms pehle i was charging 100 rupees a kg now i will charge 110 rupees a kg because he knows he's not going to lose his buyer so when the situation is such and a firm grows the price of input the price of raw material might increase if the supplier has a monopoly rising price of inputs similarly the workers might also exploit the situation especially if a, if a trade union is backing them up you know when a firm expands when a when a business grows and they are under pressure they have to meet deadlines the workers might start blackmailing them they know the firm they have to meet a deadline they are under pressure their orders to be taken care of so the workers might also exploit the situation and start demanding higher wages or better facilities especially if a, if a trade union is there to to back them up so these are the two possible diseconomies of scale rising prices of inputs and management problems and both will come into effect in case of large firms all right so that's the end of it we went through the internal economy of scale and the external economy of scale and then the diseconomies of scale all right the next topic tomorrow you can write it down that's going to be mbo management by objectives theory that's going to be our next topic mbo the mbo theory management by objectives theory by a social scientist called peter drucker there was social scientist peter drucker d r u c k e r so in our class tomorrow we are going to discuss peter drucker's management by objectives theory the mbo theory so just make sure you revise whatever we've covered so far and ensure that you have a firm grip over whatever we've done so far so we we'll start discussing mbo management by objectives theory tomorrow all right all right